Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Renzo for organizing this terrific meeting. And uh, it's here in the Paul Dirac uh, Lecture Theater. And uh, I'll have to tell you a Dirac story. So Dirac was a Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge until 1970. In 1970, he retired and then took a job as a professor of physics at Florida State University. Now, I was a graduate student at Cambridge from 63 to 66, so I heard, I heard him speak at Cambridge a couple of times. Then when he came to FSU, I also heard him speak there. But the story goes as follows. He used to walk, he liked to walk and liked to think. He lived on a little hill right close to campus and he'd walk back and forth to work. And I, the road up on that hill was called Chapel Drive and he'd walk up the hill with his hands behind his back, Harris tweed on in the hot weather, you know, muffler and the shock of white hair, you know, walking up the hill. There was no sidewalk, so he was in the road. So I had an MGB, a 66 MGB, a little red, hot little car, you know, great little car, except Mike. for the exhaust system. And, you know, the exhaust system on English cars, well, they don't last too long, you know. And so by the time of 1971 came around, the, the muffler had essentially rotted away. But I was still driving it, you know. And occasionally I would see Dirac walking up the hill. But one particular day he was walking up the hill and I came up behind him and the noise was so bad it startled him. So he goes like this and he jumps around in the road and I was about to run over his right legs. I did this very quickly and this scared the hell out of me. I'm sure it did scared him too, you know. And for me, I got to thinking, whoa, I almost ran over the man. <laughs> Tell you what, folks, if I would run over the man, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be in another line of work entirely. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to talk about, to begin with, defects in excitable media. So here's a grass fire is one I'll talk about. Arrhythmian fibrillation and heart muscle. The BZ reaction, belosov zabotinsky reaction. So I'll talk about that quite a bit. And the wave at a football game. In fact, it's the wave at a football game where you can really understand the meaning of a defect. First of all, if you've got a bunch of fans at a football game, is that an excitable medium? You're damn right. I mean, half of them are drunk, you know, so, and they're very excited. So suppose you've got the gang at the, at the football stadium and the field is full of fans as well, and you're standing right on the 50-yard line in the middle, and the wave goes around. In the middle there, there are people next to you sort of doing the wave, if you try to do the wave, there's no way you can do it continuously with the folks around you. You are the defect. So you have a spiral wave going around and the defect is you. So, and if you got say a grass fire in an excitable medium, so you're in a, a big prairie and you start a fire, you have a ring of flame. Out in front of the flame, it's, the grass is excitable, it's ready to burn. Just in back, it's refractory. And, and if you have two of these waves that crash into each other, they mutually annihilate. So here are waves of excitation in two dimensions. You have kind of target waves and spiral waves. And you can think of these two pictures as cross sections of the three dimensional picture. Here you've got sort of target uh, wave pattern in 3D. And here's a scroll wave where this defect here becomes a line. It's where this, the scroll wave uh, it rotates around. And um, here I've got pictures of the time evolution of the BZ reaction. And, here you've got a target wave. Here you've got counter-rotating spiral waves. It turns out that every time you've got a right-hand one, you have to have a left-hand one. So that's what I'm going to prove today. Turns out that's a useful thing to do. And you can have multiple arms in the BZ reaction. Here's one with four arms rotating counterclockwise. Here's one with six arms rotating clockwise. So the local structure can be have multiple arms coming into the defect itself right in the middle. So the mathematical problem is you want to produce a mathematical condition, necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of these wave patterns in 2 and 3D. And that has to do with creating phase maps where the discontinuities of the phase maps are the defects. So here's the phase map picture, say, for the BZ reaction. The wave front, I'm sorry, the wave front here is sort of points that are in isophase. And if you draw a line that goes from one wave front to another, it goes through the excitable region up to the refractory region, and that's a trip around to the phase circle. So I've got the medium, which is 
usually S3 or R3. I take away the phase singularity, so this is the complement, and I map to the phase circle like this. So it's a map defined on the exterior of the link or the knots. And the pullback of the base point here is the isophase, the spiral wave itself. You also can pull back the normal vector to get you a normal vector field on the wavefront, tells you which way it's going to go in space. So the idea is to study these phase maps, to actually construct them. If you've got local information around the singularities, can you extend it to all of space to get a phase map? And the answer is, there are if and only if conditions, both in two and three dimensions, and in bounded situations as well. So here's you know, a two-dimensional medium. The pullback is arcs and lines. In three dimensions, the pullback is surfaces. So these are the wavefronts in 3D. So there's a co-dimension two submanifold. That's the phase defect. And in 2D, it's points. In 3D, it's an oriented link. So suppose I've got no boundary. The medium is R2 or S2. And I've got organizing data. I've got points, SI, which are singularities. I've got the number of arms at each singularity, NI, as I go from one to N. And I've got whether it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. So this is the local organizing data. It's what's happening at the singularities themselves in 2D. So here I've got two arms rotating counterclockwise, so it's plus one. Three arms going clockwise, so sigma is minus one. The phase singularity is the center point. So there's a theorem. Given this information, so this local organizing information, a spiral 2D wave pattern exists satisfying this data if and only if they add up to zero. And so here's the proof. I'll do the proof that it has to be zero. The proof that if it's zero, you can get the wave, I'll do later. It uh, uses obstruction theory. So here I've got the complement of the defects. Take out away all these points. I've got the phase map. And it's, it, you can think of uh, the stuff that's happening is down in the south here. And suppose you take the North Pole. So you can think of this maybe like as a hurricane near Florida. Of course, that's where they are. And you know, you're up at the North Pole and you say a, a little circle around the North Pole, uh, the phase map's defined and it's essentially constant. So the winding number of this circle, if you map to the phase circle, is zero. And you've got basically a disk separating this from all the action. So here's the sort of the one circle at infinity. Here's all that wave stuff. You go by homotopy down to go around each of the little things here. And the winding number that you get on each of these little singularities is Ni times uh, sigma i. And when you add them all up, that's the total winding number. And since this winding number at the outside was zero, then it has to be zero on the inside. So uh, the winding node is preserved by this homotopy of loops. And I guess if, if you're doing this in some other manifold, you get sort of the Euler characteristic. So the poincare hopf theorem here, this is done on a disk. In 3D, you have so sort of these spiral waves, the phase singularities turn out to be these arcs and lines and the, and the surfaces wind around. So in 3D, as you saw in Mark's talk, you get frame knots with the ciphered framing. So you get ciphered surfaces. The wave fronts themselves are ciphered surfaces, assuming that there's one arm coming in at all the, at all the singular points. You get a frame knot or a framed link. And the ciphered surfaces. So here's a picture, a famous picture. I'll, I'll, I'll skip this one. I'd like to also talk about what happens with vortex reconnection and find quantities that are conserved by vortex reconnection. Uh, so here's some solar flares. Here's some anti-parallel vortex vortices that get reconnected. And as Koya Shimakawa pointed out, this same thing happens in DNA. So here are two counter-rotating vortices. You, uh, they come together and they, uh, you get this, this reconnection event. And this is what Koya talked about, this, the fluid vortex reconnection cascade, the trefoil, the hop flink, everything's oriented. A big circle and then two little unknot and unlinked circles. So 
Koya talked about that. And if you look at that uh, video by the Irvine lab, you see that you have this anti-parallel reconnection of this trefoil vortex here. So you have this reconnection, it's anti-parallel, and you get this by just suddenly tracing out these pictures in the, in the video. So the reconnection questions are, find conserved quantities under anti-parallel reconnection. And it turns out that ciphered surfaces help you do this. Uh, we'll prove that writhe is conserved under any anti-parallel reconnection, and that if you also have ciphered framing, then twist is also conserved if you have an anti-parallel reconnection. So here's a picture that I saw in Quanta magazine that takes the Irvine picture, and here's the writhing of a bundle, and here's the twisting of the bundle. So let's talk about writhe. And this is the crossing sign convention. You take two oriented skew lines and you look at how they cross and you get plus or minus. Uh, the writhe is you take, think of a, of a circle as rigid, put an orientation on it, look at a projection and add up all the sign crossings. Then you do that under all projections. You average over all projections. That's kind of an energy valued function on the space of projections, which is the two sphere. And uh, that's the ride. That's a real number that tells you how twisted up the curve is. And here I have DNA pictures of higher and higher writhe. With real high writhe, this duplex DNA looks like a, a line. So I'm gonna talk about PL curves. So with PL curves, you can sort of do things locally. You like take two edges on the curve and look at how they interact. And you have contributions to the writhe of every pair of curves. On, a, on either the same circle to get writhe or on different circles to get linking number. And so here's a two, two little pieces here, and you can see the crossing in one direction, and in the antipodal direction, you also see the same crossing. So you'll have like two open sets, which are antipodal to each other, and you compute the area of these two open sets on the space of all projections, the two sphere. That number is the contribution to writhe just from those two edges. So suppose I have an oriented polygon within edges. The rye, the bay, you have to divide, to average it, you're gonna divide by the area of the unit sphere, which is the space of all projections. So that's one over four pi. You simply take the rye contribution of AI against AJ, and you sum over this double summation. So every edge gets paired with every other edge and you add them all up, that's the rye. And if you have two disjoint polygons, A and B, one within edges and one with M edges, then the linking number is the same summation, except you're looking at the edges in A versus the edges in B. So suppose you now have the uh, disjoint union of oriented polygons. So I've got A union B, I want to compute the rye of A union B. Well, I've got the edges of A versus the edges of A, the edges of A versus the edges in B, the edges in B versus the edges in A, and the edges in B versus the edges in B. It turns out that this contribution, AIBJ, is the same as BJAI. It doesn't matter which one you think of as coming first. So this summation and this summation are identical. So the rise of the union of two curves is the rise of A plus two times the linking number plus the rise of B. And I want to think about doing a reconnection on a curve. So I've got, in this case, say I've got two curves, A and B, and I'm gonna do a reconnection. So I think of them as maybe being rigid and I'm gonna move one by translation, one to the other until, I'm sorry, until this edge, and I'm assuming this edge, here it is in A, here it is in B, and they're oriented oppositely. So this is anti-parallel reconnection. So here's A union B. I translate B a little bit, keep A fixed, and I get this theta curve intermediate. A connects on B star. So that's a theta curve. And now if you erase this edge, which is counted twice, one going up and one going down, you get the connected sum, the reconnected guy. And so I'm gonna compute the rise here, here, and here, and claim that they're all the same. Okay. So the rise of A union B, I claim, is equal to the rise of the, of the intermediate, that theta curve. 
And that's because translation preserves everything. And you know, that edge is counted twice. Translation preserves all these numbers. The common edge in the theta curve is counted twice. But since it's going in opposite directions, its contribution to everything cancels out. Going this way cancels out going that way. So the rise of the, I'm sorry, the rise of the theta curve is the rise of the connected sum because these are counted and they go in opposite directions. So the rise contributions cancel. And that now proves that the rise of A unit B is the rise of A connects on B. You can also read this backwards. So if you take the connected sum and get two disjoint curves, then the rise is preserved. So this proves that the rise helicity is conserved in the anti parallel reconnection for PL curves. I now want to talk about cycle framings. And uh, here's a flux tube ribbon. So got this center line here, and I've got this flux tube, and I've got this ribbon. And you can think of this ribbon perhaps as being where the psychic surface whose boundary is AI, where it comes in and it intersects the tube. I get this curve of AI and have this push off of AI con, which is anti axitonic of AI, and it's move across the ribbon. AI con goes into the boundary of the torus, the normal bunch to the uh, curve. So now you can compute twist. So this is the usual definition of twist. Uh, yes. Sorry. I'm not used to this lounge singing, you know, and fortunately for you, I will not break into song unless somebody breaks into music. So it's going to be okay. Thank you. So you take a frame and you move it a little bit along the axis here and you look at an incremental twist and you integrate that guy around the axis of the tube. And that gives you the twist. Of this thing. It's again, it's a real number. And here, this is the definition of helicity that you've seen many times using integrals. But there's a better way to think about it topologically, and that's due to Moffat and Rica. So this flux tube topology, you can convert helicity, those integrals, to a topological idea. So I've got a flux tube with center line C gamma, a flux ribbon R gamma, and flux phi. And the flux ribbon boundary is the center line plus this push off where the, where the, the annulus ends up out on the, on the boundary of the tubular neighborhoods. So the helicity is phi squared times the self linking number, which is the linking number of the center line and that push off. And so this is the famous linking number equals rive plus twist. So you get phi squared, the flux, times the linking number of C gamma and C gamma prime. And so this is a topological invariant. So it's a linking number. Uh, and so if you've got a ciphered surface, for example, the ciphered surface would bound this curve here, C gamma prime, away from the, the tubular neighborhood, which would mean that the linking number of C gamma and C gamma prime has to be zero. So if you've got a ciphered surface, then this C gamma prime is the longitude on the torus. It bounds the ciphered surface, and the linking number here is zero. So the helicity is zero if this thing is ciphered framed with a single circle. But it turns out it's zero all the time, no matter how many components you have, if you've got a ciphered surface. So we'll reconnect two tubes of the same flux. So we'll assume the flux is one for the calculation. Um, so the helicity of the union of two flux tubes of same flux one, the helicity of alpha union beta is the self-linking number of alpha plus the self-linking number of beta plus two times the linking number here. So that's equal to the twist plus ride of the first tube. And so twist plus ride of the second tube and two times the linking number. So, so this I would call the rive helicity here, or the I can I can rewrite it like this. I take these numbers and re redo them as the rive of one plus the rive of that plus two times the linking number. As we know, that's the rive of the disjoint union plus the twist adding up here. So the helicity consists of the rive helicity of the union of the two plus the twist helicity adding up the twist along the two tubes. 
So helicity is the sum of rye helicity and twist helicity. And I've just proved to you that this rye helicity is invariant under anti-parallel reconnection. So I'm going to talk about ciphered framing again. This Mark Dennis did a good job, of, and so did Koya, talking about ciphered surfaces. So a ciphered surface, if L is an oriented link, a ciphered surface for L is an oriented surface V, such that the boundary V is equal to the link L. Uh, examples of ciphered surfaces as well, there's the Gross-Potajewski isosurface, where you've got a phase map, optical knots, as you saw in Mark's talk, and the BZ reaction wavefront, and so on. Uh, and the ribbon inside the tube and the push off of the center line onto the boundary of the tube all live on the ciphered surface V. So the ciphered surface V comes in and intersects the tube in this ribbon that twists around the center line. And that happens for each component of the link. Again, I'm assuming that there's one arm coming in at each and every one of the components here. So here's some pictures. That's not a ciphered surface because it's not orientable. Here, this is a ciphered surface for the trough wall. It's hard to see the trough, it's kind of in the back there. And this is a ciphered surface for the hop link. So these are pictures of ciphered surfaces. Um, and it's interesting to compute. Here I've got a ciphered surface. I've got this red knot K, it's a trough oil knot. I've got this blue ciphered surface here. And I've got the push off, which is, well, here I'm thinking of the center line as being this black one here. K prime and the push off is K. And the black one, if you trim off this little annulus between the black one and the red line, you get the cipher surface which bounds K prime here. So the push off lives on the cipher surface, the intersection of V with the tube around K. If V prime is V minus the ribbon, it's a trimmed ribbon, the boundary of V is K, the boundary of V prime is K prime, and K, the center line, does not intersect V prime. You can compute the uh, linking numbers by means of intersection numbers. So if you've got a cycle B, it's a, uh, a circle, and it bounds V2 here, this surface, you've got another curve A that intersects it. Turns out that B is the boundary of V2. The linking number of A and B is the intersection number, A with V2, in this case is plus one. So you, I'm gonna compute linking numbers by means of intersection numbers with ciphered surfaces. So I'll now prove that the ciphered framed link has zero helicity. So I've got a ciphered frame linked within components. I've got a ciphered surface V, the boundary of V is L. And V intersects the boundaries of tubes around each of uh, those link components producing ribbons and push-offs AI prime, which live on the ciphered surface V. I'm going to delete the interiors of the ribbons to obtain V prime. So V prime is the ciphered surface that co-spans all the AI primes, the push-offs, and it lives entirely in the complement of all those tubes. So the center lines of those tubes do not intersect V prime. So the boundary of V prime is L prime, and that's, the, as I said, the union of all the push-offs. L does not intersect, the link I started with does not intersect V prime. And it turns out the link of any two of the components, AI and AJ, if you put a prime on either one of them, you always get the same linking number because AJ is, amb I'm sorry, AJ is ambient isotopic to AJ prime inside the tube, the J tube. And so all these linking numbers are the same if I is different from J. So with or without primes, the linking numbers are all identical. And the linking number of AI and AI prime is the self-linking number of AI. So if I take LI prime to be the push off AI prime and then all the other defects AJ prime, then the linking number of AI with LI prime is the intersection number of AI with V prime because the boundary of V prime is LI prime. And so I get, it's the self-linking number of AI plus the linking number of AI with AJ, all the others. So this is something that's happening for the ith, the ith component of your link. So you get this equation here, these numbers add up to zero. 
for each I, I goes from one to N. And so I'm calling this number here, the individual helicity of AI. And it turns out that this is the necessary and sufficient condition that all these numbers are zero is the necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the ciphered surface. And of course, since the individual helicity of each AI is zero, if you add up all the individual helicities, you get the helicity, the total helicity of the link, which is zero plus zero plus is equal to zero. So this proves that the helicity of an in-component link that's ciphered framed, has this ciphered surface, is zero. And if you look at this equation here, if you think about it, suppose the self-linking number of AI is different from zero. That means that there have to be some other components around AJs whose linking number with AI is non-zero in order for these guys to cancel out. So as you heard in the talks yesterday, if you just got one circle and its self-linking number is non-zero, it can't be ciphered framed. You've got to have at least one other curve going through it. Maybe there are more, maybe there's five. You know, there has to be at least one so that this, this number can, these numbers can add up to zero. Well, here's the proof for which I basically told you that already. Uh, the individual helicity of each curve is zero and the total helicity is the sum of the individual helicities. So it all adds up to zero. So this is just a tedious way to say all this for two curves instead of N. But this is the interesting theorem here, is that this is a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of the ciphered surface. So the ciphered surface exists if and only if each individual helicity is zero for all of the components. So I've seen that this is necessary, but how do you prove it's sufficient? If you've got this local organizing information around each of the curves, you know the self-linking number and you know the linking numbers with all the other guys, and they all add up to zero. How do you be, uh, then produce a phase map that makes this happen? Well, you've got the link complement. So if you drill out the interior of the tubular neighborhood of each of the components of the link, you have the link exterior X, and the boundary of X turns out to be the, these torus, tori, that are all the boundaries of these tubes. The phase map is already defined by the framing. I mean, the framing, this cipher surface in there tells you how to map this guy to the phase circle. So if this is the longitude, this is the center line, this is the longitude, so this is the push off that has linking number zero with this black guy here, the center line. So that's the reference. If you take one of these field lines and look at how it intersects a sort of circle here on the, in the normal bundle, you get this poloidal angle. Yes, that's the map. So that tells you how to map the boundary of all these, these tubes to the circle. So you've got the complement X, you've got the boundary all mapped in by the, the framing, and you want to extend that to a map on all of X. So this is a standard problem in uh, topology, at least topology the way it was done in the 60s, you know, back in the day. So you've got a phase map defined on the boundary by the framing. Here's the inclusion map. <coughs> boundary X into X, and you want to extend it to phi twiddles that maps X to S1, the phase circle. So in our situation, uh, you know that the base point on the phase circle is a regular point of phi restricted to boundary X. We want to extend it to this map phi twiddle. To, you want to extend it to a smooth map such that star, the base point on the circle, is a regular point of this uh, extension. Suffice is to contain a continuous extension because you can always twiddle it to make it smooth. Um, so here's the game. You do obstruction theory, you start chasing diagrams. <coughs> so this is a set of homotopy classes of maps from boundary X to S1. This is a set of homotopy classes of maps from X to S1. The inclusion map, this is a contravariant functor, so the inclusion map goes the wrong way. It goes from here to there. You got phi, this guy that we started with. And it turns out that these, because S1 is a k pi one, this thing is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a one-dimensional cohomology, boundary X with Z coefficients. And this guy is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a one-dimensional cohomology with X Z coefficients. This is the cohomology exact sequence. 
of the pair X boundary X. <coughs> this is the homology exact sequence of the same pair, Z coefficients, and this is Poincaré duality. All these diagrams commute. So we start with this guy here, we map it down to homology, uh, cohomology and boundary X, we map it to H1 of boundary X Z. And this, these guys are generated by the meridian curves, the little circles that, you know, go around each one of the components one time. And then you go here, and then you go over here to H1X, and that's where each one of these little guys goes to zero over here. And so I'll, I'll give a little more of this argument. You map it down to here, and you prove that this map goes to zero, so by exactness, there's a guy here in the kernel that maps to this guy. Once you've got this thing here, you take it back up, and that's the one you want. So it's a case of chasing diagrams. So this is what I was saying by the obstruction theory. <coughs> we want to find V tilde so that I star V tilde is equal to phi in homotopy class of maps. So phi goes down here to summation Ni lambda I in boundary X. And uh, H1 of X is then generated by these meridian curves. And I star takes this thing to summation Ni, I star lambda I, and I star lambda I turns out to be summation Ni lambda I j. So that's one of these individual helicities in each one of these components here, and it goes to zero. So this proves that this map goes to zero here. By exactness, there's something here that goes to it, and you just pull back to here, and that's the one you want. This same uh, technique works in dimension two as well. I'm not going to talk about that. But if you've got anti-parallel reconnection, I claim that it preserves cipher framing. And so helicity rather than twist are all preserved. So here's A union B, and here's the cipher surface. It's anti-parallel. So when you do a reconnection, you get a cipher surface on the reconnected thing. So the cipher surface lives through the reconnection event. So you start out with zero helicity, and you end with zero helicity. And since you start, helicity is the sum of writhe helicity plus twist helicity. <coughs> Anti-parallel reconnection preserves the framing. So helicity is zero before and after reconnection. If helicity is zero. That means that the writhe helicity is equal to minus the twist helicity. We already know that the writhe helicity is conserved under anti-parallel reconnection. That means the twist helicity is also conserved under anti-parallel reconnection. So both all these Right elicity and twist elicity are conserved by anti-parallel reconnection. You can also do multiple arms. <laughs> so here, I've got uh, this defect, and it's got three arms coming in. They're rotating sort of clockwise, clockwise around here. So here are three sheets coming in, and you can think of these three sheets as being on a, a cyclic surface that may or may not be connected. But if you look at the normal bundle and look at a disk in the normal bundle, you'll see these three lines coming in where the sheet intersects the disk. So it's a three-arm defect. Here's one with a two-arm defect. And the center line here is, in fact, a knotted. But the, you get a trefoil, a red trefoil coming in. Uh, and you have these two sheets coming in. So you have two sheets. And the linking number, uh, this is two. So you, th you think of this as a generalized ciphered surface. I mean, it's not a manifold. If, uh, if your number of arms are bigger than one, it's not a manifold at the, the defect line itself. But a little bit away, it is. So if you take sort of a tubular neighborhood of, say, uh, radius one, and then another tubular neighborhood of radius a half, you have sort of two copies of where the cyclic surface intersects that two, one on the outside and one on the inside. And it's the one on the inside you can think of as having the link push off of the one on the outside. The one on the outside is the one that lives on the cyclic surface. So you get that these things exist if and only if in I, the number of sheets times at I times the linking of AI with AJ star plus NI times NJ linking number of AI and J is zero. So this is the number that takes the place of the individual helicity. 
and it's a necessary and sufficient condition to the existence of um, this multi-armed cyber service. Uh, Here's a picture that shows you why you have to get these multiples here, why you have this number of arms times linking numbers. So here I have this picture. The center line is not shown, but I've got these two. The curve is the truffle line, and you can think of sort of the yellow truffle line as being on the interior torus, and the outside truffle line being on the exterior torus. And you compute the linking number of these two guys, B and B prime, you get minus six. Which is two times minus three, and two is another line coming into the center line here. So that's sort of how you do the computation as to what's happening at a center line. Um, so last night I was trying to get to sleep and um, having problems, and I got to thinking about Mitch Berger's talk. So when Mitch, I don't have a picture, but Mitch Berger has. Say you've got three space and you've got upper half of three space. So the boundary between the two halves is the X, Y plane where the Z is zero. And coming out of this plane, you have tubes. And the tubes are doing all sorts of things when I mean, they're going back to the center line. And you have curves on the boundaries of these tubes. Maybe two on the first one, one on the second, 17 on the third one, and so on. And you've got the cores of the tubes themselves, which you can think of as on the center, on this, on this plane, you can think of those cores as being just like in the BZ reaction. They're point defects, and the number of arms coming in gives you that local winding information that I showed you in the BZ reaction. So it's the same on this sort of cross-section of helicity here. And what I want to do is compute helicity for this bounded situation. The, the way you can do this is that you first look on the plane. The picture on the plane, as I said, is the same as the picture for the BZ reaction. And all, if those numbers all add up to zero, then you can connect with curves in the plane that make all those lines on the surfaces connect up with all the other lines and you have a bunch of circles now. Where at the bottom, they all connect up with some other circle via this phase map thing. What about the center lines themselves? Well, if you want to connect them up and make them circles, you simply go down a little bit to make a plane parallel to the, the, the plane at z equals zero, so z equals minus epsilon, and you, then you have just points, and then you can connect them up as well. You can think of this, so you connect them up, and now everything is now circles, oriented circles. You now have an oriented link which lives almost all in upper half of three space. So, you know, you can use this ciphered framing stuff. If all these linking numbers add up, you know, you're going to get ciphered surfaces, then you can make them live in the upper half of three space as well. So the question is, does this help? And the answer is, no, I don't know. But at least you can get the ciphered surfaces and maybe you can play this same game and produce proofs that the poloidal and the toroidal helicity are zero? Well, maybe one's equal to minus the other. I don't know. But uh, if I ever get to understanding how you compute those, then maybe this will help. The problem with this construction is, of course, you have all these in the XY plane, the, 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 that bottom of the situation, the curves that you get when you connect them all up, those aren't unique. There are many ways to do this. I mean, and when you do it differently, of course, there's going to be a change in the helicity. So how do you make that happen? Well, I don't know. But at least you can get ciphered surfaces, and I think this will be of some help in uh, doing helicity computations. So these are some papers where some of this stuff is contained. I'd like to thank the Simons Foundation, and thank you for listening. <laughs>